Hello friends, this presentation is a part of Enemy ICT project sponsored by MHRD Government of India. Let's start a discussion of introduction to product recovery and purification that is downstream processing. Downstream processing is a collective term for all the steps which required in order actually to recover useful products from any kind of industrial process. In reality, the desired final forms of the products are usually quite far removed from the state in which they are first obtained in the bioreactor. Many operations which are standard in the laboratory will become impractical or uneconomic on the process scale. The extraction and purification of fermentation products may be difficult and costly. Extraction should be as quickly as possible with high quality product at an efficient recovery rate using minimum plant investment operated at minimal cost. Recovery cost of microbial products may vary from 15% to as high as 70% of the total manufacturing costs. Thus, the high and sometimes dominant cost of downstream processing will affect the overall objective in some fermentations. At the time of harvesting, the specific products may be present at a low concentration in an aqueous solution that contains intact microorganisms, cell fragments, soluble and insoluble medium components and other metabolic products. All these factors tend to increase the difficulties of product recovery. So efficient recovery need speed of operation as an overriding factor, knowledge of labile nature of products, type of processing equipment and size of processing equipment. Criteria for the selection of recovery process, process which should be there in our mind. The intracellular or extracellular location of the product so we can finalize whether cell disruption will be necessary or not. The concentration of the product in the fermentation broth, the physical and chemical properties of the desired product, the intended use of the products, the minimum acceptable standard of purity, the magnitude of biohazard of the product or broth, the impurities in the fermented broth and the marketable price of the product. By checking all these criteria, we can finalize methods for recovery and purification. There is no one unique, ideal or universal operation or even sequence of operations which can be recommended. Individual unit operations must be combined in the most suitable way for a particular problems. So overall process includes first fermentation broth is separated then solids are removed from broth. If product is intracellular then cell disruption is necessary otherwise directly primary, primary isolation of product is started then purification and concentration of the product and finally final product will be purified in isolated form. There are four stages of downstream processing. First is removal of insoluble, second product isolation, third product purification and fourth product polishing. Stage 1. The first stage for the recovery of an extracellular product aims to remove large solid particles and microbial cells. It is possible by various measures like by centrifugation, filtration, sedimentation, precipitation, flocculation, electroprecipitation and gravity settling. Stage 2 is product isolation. In this stage, the broth is extracted into major fractions using various techniques like ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, adsorption, ion exchange, gel filtration or affinity chromatography, liquid-liquid extraction, two-phase aqueous extraction, precipitation, etc. It allows the removal of unnecessary components whose properties differ distinctly from that of the desired product. Stage 3 is product purification. Once the product containing fraction is purified by fractional precipitation, furthermore precise chromatographic techniques and crystallization is used 
to obtain a highly concentrated product which is essentially free from impurities. Steps in this stage are expensive because it requires sensitive and sophisticated equipment which contributes a major section of the entire downstream processing expenditure. Last stage is product polishing. It is the last processing steps which end with packaging of the product. It includes crystallization, desiccation and spray drying. Sometimes it also includes operations to sterilize the product by removing contaminants which otherwise affect product safety. It must be remembered that the upstream and downstream processing are integral parts of an overall process. As they are interconnected, neither stage should be developed independently as this might result in problems and unnecessary expenditure. So by taking care of some steps in the upstream process, product recovery may be made easier. For example, selection of test strain. By selecting test microorganisms that do not produce any pigment and or undesirable metabolites. And environmental setup by adjusting the production environments to allow least production of undesirable and secondary metabolites. Beside this, some process parameters should be checked and maintained like time of harvesting, pH maintenance during fermentation and harvesting, temperature maintenance, use of suitable chemicals for flocculation and separation. The recovery and purification of many compounds may be achieved by a number of alternative ways. The selection of a proper route under given circumstances depends on capital cost, processing costs, through output requirement, yield potential, product quality, technical expertise available, conformance to regulatory requirements, waste treatment needs, continuous or batch processing, automation, as well as personal health and safety. What is need? The major problem currently faced in product recovery is the large scale purification of biologically active molecules. For a process to be economically viable, large scale production is required and therefore bioactivity of product should be accurate, purity of the product should be of high degree, safety, legislation and regulatory requirements should be taken under consideration. So, in short, recovery and purification involve number of techniques like removal of microbial cells and other solid matters, form separation, precipitation, filtration, centrifugation, cell disruption, liquid-liquid extraction, solvent recovery, two-phase aqueous extraction, supercritical fluid extraction, chromatography, membrane processes, drying, crystallization and wall growth processing. Thank you. We welcome your questions and feedback. Please visit us at our website that is www.elearnmicrobiology.com. Thank you. Hello friends. Today's topic of discussion is removal of microbial cells and other solid matters that is by foam separation and precipitation. There are various stages of recovery and purification of an extracellular product. The first stage for the downstream processing is the removal of large solid particles and microbial cells. It can be done by a number of processes like by centrifugation, filtration, sedimentation, precipitation, flocculation, electroprecipitation, etc. Centrifugation is widely adapted technique for this purpose but requires large energy input per unit mass of cells separated. So many of our efforts have been made to develop energy saving separation methods. During filtration, the use of filter aids is necessary to improve filtration rates because many microbial cells are very minute. Sedimentation employs surface active agents to obtain separation. To improve sedimentation rates in centrifugation, heat and flocculation treatments are employed. However, the surfactants reduce the metabolic activities of the cells, so separated cells cannot be reused. 
Therefore, such methods can be used in operations where the reuse of the cells is not required such as sewage treatment. The methods of microbial cell separation have been accomplished for many years. Borden et al. in 1987 examined the use of electrophoresis and dielectrophoresis to exploit the charged properties of microbial cells as well as ultrasonic treatment to improve flocculation characteristics and magnetic separations. The problems associated with all these techniques include high cost and scale up difficulties. Solution of this problem is the use of two phase liquid extraction. Here we need to discuss in detail foam separation. This is well known method of separation of components of a solution which is based on the differences in their surface activities. It is particularly suitable as foams are having large interfacial area per unit volume of the liquid. It allows separation of whole cells or molecules such as protein or colloidal. Materials first selectively adsorbed to the surface of gas bubbles rising through a liquid and then be concentrated and finally removed by skimming. This is the schematic flow diagram for foam separation where by sparger liquid is continuously mixed and foam get produced. Whenever it get overflow, it will be collected in another container where it will be broken and collapsed foam will be collected in another vessel. By the use of surface active agents such as long chain fatty acids, amines and quaternary ammonium compounds, surface activity of some materials can be improved. Materials made surface active and concentrated are termed Coligans, whereas the surface active agents used are termed collectors. During foam separation, some parameters should be checked such as pH, air flow rates, surfactants and coligand collector ratio. Rubin et al. in 1966 separated 90% of the E. coli cells in 1 minute and 99% in 10 minutes by foam separation using lauric acid, steril amine or t octyl amine as surfactants. This method also proved effective with other organisms like chlorella species and chlamydomonas species. Greaves and Wang in 1966 have used ethyl hexadecyl dimethyl ammonium bromide for E. coli enrichment. Another technique which we need to discuss in detail is precipitation. Precipitation is the chemical process in which solid gets formed in a solution or inside another solid. The solid formed in a solution is called the precipitate and the liquid remaining above the solid is called the supernatant. Precipitation may be carried out at various stages of the product recovery process. This is the simplest method for isolation of fermentation products. To allow enrichment and concentration of desired product in one step, precipitation is used. Therefore, it reduces the volume of material for further processing. There are number of agents which are used in precipitation. Here, I have given some examples. First, acids and bases. They are used to change pH of a solution until isoelectric point of the compound is achieved. At that pH, molecules precipitate due to decrease in the solubility. Second, salts such as ammonium and sodium sulfates. They are used for the precipitation of specifically proteins. The salt removes water from the surface of the protein and allows the exposure of the non-polar sites by that facilitate the aggregation and precipitation. Organic solvents. For example, proteins can be precipitated out of a broth by the addition of chilled ethanol and acetone. Methanol can be used in the precipitation of dextrin. Some non-ionic polymers such as polyethylene glycol can also be used to precipitate proteins. Next, polyelectrolytes. They can be used in the precipitation of a range of compounds. Protein binding dyes. 
Proteins can precipitate by some protein binding dyes like triazine dyes which precipitate various classes of protein. And last is affinity precipitation. It is a new method in which select, it will allow selective precipitation of compounds. Thank you. We will welcome your questions and feedback. Please visit us at our website www.elearnmicrobiology.com.